Thanks for sticking with this series so far. We're on chapter 3, verses 9 to 20. All people are sinners. And yes, that means you, and that means me. We are all sinners. You know that word sin, it's not actually a religious word. It's not a spiritual word. It's an archery term, hamarsha. Uh, as you shoot a bow and arrow, if the arrow does not hit the bullseye, you have hamarshad. You have missed the bullseye. Hamarsha just means to miss, miss the bullseye. Sometimes we fall short on purpose because we sin because we like to sin, and other times we, we miss the bullseye simply by accident. Accident, or we didn't even know there was a bullseye to hit. Hamarsha is, is a term uh, taken from archery. So let's look at verse 9 as we begin. Chapter 3, verse 9, no better. Chapter 3, verse 9, what shall we conclude then? Are we any better? Not at all. We have already made the charge that Jews and Gentiles alike are all under sin. Bum, bum, bum. We're all under sin, and that's something that you and I have to come to terms with, that I'm a sinner and you're, you're a sinner. In, this, in today's age, where nobody likes to consider that, oh, I'm a sinner. No, I'm not a sinner. I maybe, I maybe I do bad things sometimes, but at the core of my being, I'm not really bad. I'm not talking about good and bad here. I'm talking about sin. You and I have missed the bullseye. You and I are not perfect. You and I get things wrong from time to time, either by accident or intentionally. That no one person is bad better than another person. I can't compare myself to you and say, well, my sin isn't so bad because look at your sin. You can't compare yourself to me saying, well, my sin isn't so bad. Look at that guy's sin on the TV there, on the, on the video monitor there. We can't do that. No one person is better than another. We are all sinners. Are we better than they? Not at all is what, is what Paul says. So, so we being Jew, he's speaking to the, to the Jewish people. Are we Jewish people better than those Gentile people? And, and Paul says, no way. We are all equal. We are all sinners. We've all fallen short. Chapter 3, verse 10, all are in need. Verse 10 says, as, as it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. That word righteous, you know, righteousness, it means that we have fulfilled all of the obligations of the law, either the law of God in the Old Covenant or law of conscience. We've, we've fulfilled all of the obligations of the law, both actively and passively. And, and therefore, when we have fulfilled all the obligations of the law, God declares us righteous. And of course, we want to be declared righteous because when we're declared righteous, that means we're entitled to the benefits of the law. In our case, that would be eternal life. Unfortunately, none of us are righteous. The text has just said, none of us are righteous. No one is righteous, not even one. We're all in need. There are no advantages in life that take away our need of salvation. Now, particularly applied here to the Jews, but it's universally true. Whether you're born in a Christian home, whether whether you're a pastor, some kind of other spiritual leader, well-educated, born in the right family, not born in the right family, the underdog, who, who knows? There, there's nothing, no status in life that can remove us from this. Every single one of us, are, uh, we're all sinners and we're all equal in this. Chapter 3, verse 11, trained on God. Paul continues to quote from the Old Testament here and what he's doing. He's showing us how desperate we are. He's showing us that we're all sinners. He's showing us that we're all in this together. We're all equally in need of God. So he continues to say, there is no one who understands, no one who seeks God. I just don't get it. You just don't get it. People generally don't get it. Generally speaking, people do not desire to discipline themselves to please God in all aspects of life. We may try to discipline ourselves to please God in some aspects of life, uh, but in other areas, we're just, we're just clueless. We don't pursue God like we should pursue God because we're clueless about this. That, of course, changes a little bit, hopefully, after we've come to Christ. Once we, become, once we become a Christian, the Holy Spirit does a work in us, and our desires change, and we desire to please God. And we're no longer obligated to follow a law because inside our heart we desire to please God, but still, we lack this understanding, and we're in need of help because of the sinful nature that we have inside of us. Let me just make a general observation here, give you a note on quotations. You see right here a quotation. Uh, all of this passage almost is an entire quotation. 
it's not a direct quotation. It's not a word for word quotation because you know they didn't have chapters and verses to quote from back then. It's a paraphrase. It's generally speaking, this is what the Old Testament is saying. And we see this throughout the Old Te- uh, the New Testament. Throughout the New Testament, we see these generalized quotations, not a word for word quote like you and I are accustomed to today. This is long before the printing press. So generally speaking, this is a quotation from the Old Testament, even though it's not word for word. This is an Old Testament quotation. Chapter 3, verse 12, worthless pursuits. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. Every single one of our pursuits in this life is absolutely worthless unless it drives us closer to Jesus. I can pursue a lot of things in this life. I can follow passions. I can, I can follow hobbies. I can devote my life to a career. I can devote my life to a family. All of that is good. I'm not saying that anything is bad, but it is absolutely worthless if while we're pursuing those things, we're not also first, I should say, pursuing God. If we're not first pursuing God, as we do those things, then it's all worthless because it's not going to be rewarded at the end of the day. Every pursuit is worthless and ultimately leads to destruction unless it's connected to us seeking God. 3 verse 13, collateral damage. We sometimes don't think about the the sin that's inside of us and the wrongs that we do in terms of how it's affecting other people. You know, when we get to the place we start talking about the sinful nature and, and accepting that we have a sinful nature and we do sin, sometimes we only think, okay, well, it's me damaging my relationship with God, but our sinful nature damages our my relationship with other people too. Collateral, collateral damage. 3 verse 13, their throats are open graves, their tongues practice deceit, the poison of vipers is on their lips. Listen, the very best that I can communicate is the Word of God. Hands down, nothing else compares. The very best I can communicate is the Word of God, but, but generally speaking, I don't communicate the Word of God. I communicate my opinion on the daily basis. I, I, I hang with friends. My wife and I, we, we just generally talk, not in quotations from the Bible. And so the text here, worst case scenario, before we come to Christ, when the Bible isn't even inside of us, we're hurting our relationship with other people by what we're saying and what we're doing. Our sinfulness corrupts our relationship with other people. The text says, they use their tongues to deceive. So the problem with sin isn't only that. It hurts our relationship with God. The problem with sin, the problem with me missing the mark, the problem with me missing that that perfection mark that God has said, look at this, this is all that you can be. And I say, well, no, I don't want to be all that I can be. Well, I'm hurting other people around me when I'm stepping away and saying, well, no, I don't want to be that. Then I hurt the people around me as well. 3 verse 14, vocabulary. Verse 14 says, Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. Our words and attitude are reflections of our spiritual condition. What is on the inside is going to be coming on the outside. And if on the inside we're filled with sin, then that's all that's going to be coming out. Paul continues to quote to paint this picture that you and I are in desperate need of God. You and I need a Savior because everything that's on the inside is coming out and it's only coming out in ways that hurt other people and hurt ourselves as well. Chapter 3, verses 15 to 17, true peace. Let's talk about true peace. Verse 15 to 17. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and misery mark their ways, and the way of peace they do not know. And of course they don't know the way of peace. Of course we don't know the way of peace without Jesus because Jesus is peace. Before we come to Jesus, we are hostile to God. The Bible says that we're enemies of God before we come Before we come to Jesus. There is no peace in the absence of God. There is no peace in the absence of God. If we want to see world peace and we want to see God in control, if we want to see world peace, we want to see Jesus seated, seated on the throne and all of us in submission to him, there is no peace without God. Everything else is just conciliatory. 3 verse 18, high and low opinions. There is no fear of God before their eyes. And isn't this true? It was true of me before I became a Christian, probably true of you before you became a Christian, although my story is going to be a little bit bit different than your story, of course. I was 13 when I gave my life to Jesus. I mean, I went through some time where I walked away from him a little bit, but or a lot of it. But still, I, I became a Christian when I was 13, and there was no fear of God in my life before then. Junior highs do not fear God, I'm telling you. And it wasn't until just before I, I was entering high school that suddenly I'm like, oh, wait a minute, I'm a pretty bad kid right now. And, and I think that you know, maybe judgment is coming. And, and then I gave my life to God. But generally speaking, people live like we're not accountable to anything. People live like we're not going to have to give an account about anything, like we're not going to be judged. 
Fearing the Lord is very healthy. Yes, Jesus loves you. God loves you to death. He died on the cross uh, for you and for me. But he's also going to be our judge. Fearing God is very healthy. People generally hold themselves in high regard. So I hold myself in high regard, generally speaking, and so do you. Now, they have a low opinion of God, generally speaking. This is, of course, before we come to Jesus, and reject submitting to him. People don't like to submit. We don't like the idea of having to submit to anybody. We don't even like the idea to, to submit of submitting to our boss, even though the guy or the girl writes us a paycheck and it pays our mortgage and our bills. We don't like the idea of submitting. Uh, even less, we like the idea of submitting to God. And that's just... That's just the reality of the sinful nature and what the sinful nature has been doing to us and how desperate we are in need of God because we can't fix this. We need Jesus to help us. I have a request, please. Would you please leave a, leave a comment answering one of these three questions. What did I hear? What does it mean? And what do I need to do about it? What did I hear? What does it mean? What do I need to do about it? Please leave a comment. God bless you. I'll see you next time.